Commentary by St. Nicodemus of the Holy Mountain on Canon 46 of the Canons of the Holy Apostles. Canon 46 reads, We order any bishop or presbyter that has accepted any heretic's baptism or sacrifice to be deposed. For what consonancy hath Christ with Belial, or what part hath the believer with an infidel? Interpretation It behooves Orthodox Christians to shun heretics and the ceremonies and rites of heretics. They, i.e. heretics, ought rather to be criticized and admonished by bishops and presbyters in the hope of their apprehending and returning from their error. For this reason the present canon prescribes if any bishop or presbyter shall accept a heretic's baptism as correct and true, or any sacrifice offered by them, it is ordered that he be dropped. For what agreement hath Christ with the devil? Or what portion hath the believer with an unbeliever? Those who accept the doings of heretics either themselves entertain similar views to theirs, or at any rate they lack an eagerness to free them from their misbelief. For how can those who acquiesce in their religious ceremonies and rites criticize them with the view of persuading them to give up their cacodoxical and erroneous heresy? Footnote following if any bishop or presbyter shall accept a heretic's baptism as correct and true. For this reason, too, the ecclesiastic martyr St. Cyprian, who served as bishop of Carthage, and all his synod of eighty-four bishops, which had been convoked in Carthage, following the present apostolical canon, which simply rejects any baptism of heretics, but also apostolical canon 68, which says that those who have been baptized or ordained by heretics cannot be, which is the same as saying that it is impossible for them to be, either Christians or clerics. Following, I say, these canons, they laid down a canon whereby they reject the baptism of heretics and of schismatics as well. They prove this by many scriptural assertions, and especially by that of St. Paul the Apostle, saying, One Lord, one faith, one baptism, Ephesians 4, 5. For they say, if the Catholic Church is one and the true baptism is one, how can the baptism of heretics and schismatics be a true baptism at a time when they are not included in the Catholic Church, but have been cut off from it as a result of heresy? But if the baptism of heretics and schismatics is a true baptism, and that of the Orthodox Catholic Church is also a true baptism, then there is not one baptism, as St. Paul shouts, but two, which is quite absurd. And they add this too, that this idea of not accepting a baptism of heretics is not a new or recent one of their own, but on the contrary, an old one, and one which has been approved by their predecessors. The canon of this synod was confirmed and ratified by the Holy Sixth Ecumenical Council, Canon two, and from being merely a canon, of a local and partial synod, it has now become a canon of an ecumenical council by reason of its having been confirmed and ratified by the latter. In agreement with St. Cyprian and his synod, Firmilian, who served as exarch of the synod in Iconium, and whom St. Basil the Great in his first canon calls one of his own, as being bishop of Caesarea, also invalidates and rejects the baptism of heretics. For in writing to St. Cyprian, he says the following, But who, though he has attained to the acme of perfection and of wisdom, can maintain or believe that merely the invocation of the three names of the Holy Trinity is sufficient for the remission of offenses and for the sanctification of the baptism, even when, that is to say, the one baptizing is not an orthodox. Read all his letter, which is contained in the chronicle of those who held the office of patriarch in Jerusalem, and which is needed in connection with this subject. St. Basil the Great favors this idea too, whose canons have also been confirmed and ratified by the Sixth Ecumenical Council, Canon two. For in his first canon, with the intention of saying which baptisms are acceptable and which are unacceptable, 
he divides them into two classes by saying, For it appeared to the ancients to be a reasonable rule that any baptism should be utterly disregarded that has been performed by heretics, or in other words, by those who have been utterly separated from the church and who differ from the orthodox in respect of faith itself, and whose difference is directly dependent on faith in God. As for the baptism of schismatics, on the other hand, it appeared to the synod of Cyprian and of my own Firmilian that it too ought to be disregarded and rejected, seeing that the schismatics, the novations, I mean, the incratics, the sarcophores, the Aquarians, and others, have separated in principle from the church, and after separating have not had the grace of the Holy Spirit in them any longer, as the impartation of it has ceased. Hence, as having become laymen, they have had neither the spiritual gift nor the authority to baptize or to ordain, and consequently, those who are baptized by them, as being baptized by laymen, have been ordered to be baptized with the true baptism of the Catholic Church. Yet inasmuch as it appeared reasonable to some fathers of Asia for the baptism of schismatics to be deemed acceptable for the sake of some economy in behalf of the multitude, let it be accepted. But note that the baptism of schismatics, which he accepts in his first canon, he rejects in his 47th canon by saying, In a word, we baptize all novations and encratics and sarcophores. Even if rebaptism is prohibited with you for the sake of some economy, as it is with the Romans, nevertheless let our word have the power of rejecting, to put it plainly, the baptism of such. Hence, if Basil the Great rejects the baptism of schismatics because of their having lost perfective grace, then it is needless to ask whether we ought to baptize heretics. In his 20th canon, he says decisively that the church does not accept heretics unless she baptizes them. The same opinion is held by Athanasius the Great, too, whose words were also confirmed and ratified by the Sixth Ecumenical Council. For he says in his third discourse against the Arians, the Arians are in danger, even in the very plentitude of the mystery, baptism, I mean. For while perfection through baptism is given in the name of the Father and of the Son, the Arians do not refer to a true Father owing to their denial of the likeness of the essence emanating from Him. Thus they deny even the true Son, and conjuring up another in their imagination built out of nothing real, they call this one the Son. So how can it be that the baptism given by them is not perfectly useless and vain? Though it does appear to be a baptism in pretense, yet in reality it is of no help to faith and piety. For it is not he that says merely, O Lord, that gives a correct baptism, but he that utters the invocation of the name and at the same time possesses a correct faith. On this account, too, the Savior did not command the apostles to baptize merely and in a simple fashion, but on the contrary told them first to make disciples of those about to be baptized, and then to baptize them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, in order that the faith might become correct from their having been instructed disciples, and thanks to their correct faith the perfection of the baptism might be added. It is for this reason, indeed, that many other heresies, true enough, do say only the names of the Holy Trinity, but inasmuch as they do not believe these correctly, and they have not a sound faith either, the baptism given by them is of no benefit to them, owing to its lacking piety. So that as a matter of fact, the consequences is that anyone sprinkled by them is rather polluted with impiety than redeemed from it. So the Arians, who share beliefs of Arius, though they may read the words written and may pronounce the names of the Holy Trinity in their baptism, yet they are deluding and misleading those who receive their baptism at their hands, since they are more impious than the other heretics. Moreover, Gregory the Theologian, in agreement with the aforesaid saints, says in his Discourse on Holy Baptism, addressing the Arians or even Macedoniacs, followers of Macedonius, 
usually but erroneously called in English Macedonians, who are being catechized. If you are still limping and are not prepared to lend full credence to the tenet of the perfectness of the divinity of the Son and of the Spirit, ask someone else to baptize you, or rather to say, to drown you in the baptism. Since I have no permission to separate the deity of the Son and of the Spirit from the deity of the Father, and to make you dead at a time when I ought to be regenerating you through baptism, so that you can have neither the gracious gift of baptism nor the hope which is born of baptism, because you lose your salvation in the few syllables of the words homoousian and homoousian. For no matter which of these three substances you abase from godship, you abase the whole Holy Trinity therefrom, and deprive yourself of the perfection which accrues through baptism. St. Chrysostom, too, in his sermon on the proposition, In the beginning there already was the Logos, John 1, 1, says, Let not the systems of the heretics fool you, my dear listener, for they have a baptism, but no illumination. Accordingly they are baptized, it is true, with respect to the body, but as respects the soul, they are not illuminated. Why, even St. Leo in his epistle to Nicetus asserts that no heretics confer sanctification through the mysteries, or sacraments, as they are inaptly called by the Westerners. St. Ambrose, in his statement concerning catechumens, says, The baptism of the ungodly does not sanctify. In the face of what has thus been said, one might rightfully wonder why the Holy Second Ecumenical Council in its seventh canon, but still more so why the sixth ecumenical in its ninety-fifth canon, failed to disapprove the baptism of all heretics in accordance with the apostolical canons and St. Cyprian synod, and all the other great God-bearing fathers aforementioned whose writings were confirmed and ratified, as we have said, by the Sixth Ecumenical Council itself in its second canon, whereas, on the contrary, it accepted the baptism of some heretics, but not that of others. In order to have an easily understandable solution of this perplexity, there is need that one should know beforehand that two kinds of government and correction are in vogue in the Church of Christ. One kind is called acrivia, the other kind is called economia, and moderatism, with which the economists of the Spirit promote the salvation of souls, at times with the one and at times with the other kind. So the fact is that the holy apostles in their aforesaid canons and all the saints who have been mentioned employed acrivia, and for this reason they reject the baptism of heretics completely, while on the other hand, the two ecumenical councils employed economia, and accepted the baptism of Arians, and of Macedoniacs, and of others, but refused to recognize that of Eunomians and of still others. Because in the times especially of the Second Council, the Arians and the Macedoniacs were at the height of their influence, and were not only very numerous, but also very powerful, and were close to the kings, and close to the nobles, and to the senate. Hence, for the one thing, in order to attract them to orthodoxy, and correct them the easier, and for another thing, in order to avoid the risk of infuriating them still more against the church and the Christians and aggravating the evil, those divine fathers thus managed the matter economically, managing their words economically with judgment, and condescended to accept their baptism. That we are not stating this gratuitously, and as a matter of mere verbiate, We have ample proof in the testimony of the two great fathers, St. Basil, I mean, and St. Gregory. For St. Basil, on the one hand, fearing the royal and nobilary powers of the pneumatomachists, i.e., those denying and combating the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, and flinching lest they assault the church of Caesarea, which at that time was the sole bulwark of orthodoxy, employed economia, and for a considerable length of time be refrained from calling the Holy Spirit openly a God. Gregory the Great, on the other hand, wishing to show the powers and the savageness 
of the Arians and the Macedoniacs in the farewell speech he made to the 150 bishops of the Second Ecumenical Council itself, told them, For terrible wild beasts have really fallen upon the church, and not sparing us after our period of fair weather, but on the contrary, losing all sense of shame. They are even stronger than the season. Therein he reveals that in spite of the fact that the king, or emperor, was an Orthodox Christian, in spite of the fact that Orthodoxy had been preached openly, and an ecumenical council had convened against them, yet they were still terribly and savagely set against Orthodoxy, and were stronger than the Christian party. St. Basil also said in the foregoing that he had accepted the baptism of the Novatians, otherwise called Purists, which had been accepted by both the Second and the Sixth Ecumenical Councils, merely out of regard for economy in connection with the majority of the population. For had it not been for this ground of economy, how could the Sixth Council have failed to oppose its own action to that of the Second Ecumenical Council, by itself accepting the baptism of some heretics, yet confirming and ratifying the canons of St. Basil, who in his first and 47th canons utterly refuses to recognize the baptism of heretics. Could it possibly have failed to read the canons of St. Basil itself? Or why should it not have made an exception, and have said that it confirmed and ratified all the other canons of his with the exception of only the first and the 47th? So it is plain that it left it to be understood by us that Basil the Great had employed Ecrivia, while, on the contrary, it and the Second Ecumenical Council had employed Economia. Accordingly, there appears to be no contradiction or contrariety between them. In fact, this ground of Economia is the first and principal reason why those councils accepted the baptism of some heretics and not that of others. In close proximity to the ground of economia, there stood also a second reason why they did so. This is the fact that those heretics whose baptism they accepted also rigorously observed the kind and the matter of the baptism of the Orthodox, and were willing to be baptized in accordance with the form of the Catholic Church. Those heretics, on the other hand, whose baptism they had refused to recognize, had counterfeited the ceremony of baptism and had corrupted the rite, or the mode of the kind, or, in the terminology of the Latins, species. And the same may be said of the invocations, or that of the matter, and the same may be said of the immersions and immersions, with reference to Roman Catholics and Protestants. And in proof of the fact that that really was the reason, we have trustworthy witnesses first in the very words of the seventh canon of the Second Ecumenical Council. For what other could have been the reason that it refused to recognize the baptism of the Eunomians and of the Sibelians, while, on the other hand, it accepted that of the Arians and of the Macedoniacs, at a time, moreover, when Eunomians and Arians and Macedoniacs were all stubborn heretics? For, as a matter of fact, Eunomius, like Arius, was wont to blaspheme against the deity of the only begotten Son and of the Father, by calling the former a creature, or ketisma, i.e., something which has been built or constructed or made, of the Father, and a minister, as is to be seen in the second sermon of St. Basil the Great against Eunomius. And like Macedonius, he also blasphemed against the deity of the Spirit, by asserting it to be the third in nature after the Father, as is to be seen in St. Basil's third sermon against Eunomius. Both the Sibelians and the Arians were of equal power with respect to the heresies, according to St. Gregory the Theologian, who says, It is equal insofar as impiety is concerned, whether one conjoins the person, like Sibelius, or separates the nature, like Arius. And again, for the evil in both alike notwithstanding the fact that it is to be found in things which are contraries. Thus the belief of Sibelius opens the door to Judaism, according to sacred Photius, while that of Arius introduces Hellenism. Why is it, then, 
that those who were of quite equal power with respect to the heresies were not accorded equal rights by the council. The evidence is plain that the Arians and the Macedoniacs, on the one hand, were wont to be baptized in precisely the same fashion as were the Orthodox, with three immersions and immersions, and with three invocations of the Holy Trinity, without counterfeiting either the kind of the invocations or the matter of the water. For though it is true that the Arian Valens made it a law that baptism should be performed with only one immersion, as is told by Dositheus on page 86 of the Dodecabiblis, yet that law was not obeyed, nor was it ratified, but on the contrary fell into obeyance among the Arians. For not even any mention is made of it at all in the canon in which is mentioned the baptism of the Arians, nor did Zenorius or Balsamon, or Aristinus, or Anonymous, the interpreters of the canons, say a word about it. Notwithstanding that the Arians did change even the invocations in baptism, according to Cedrinus, and the same Dositheus, by saying, In the name of the Father the greater, and of the Son the lesser, and of the Holy Spirit the least. Yet they did not make this change before the Second Ecumenical Council, but later, as the same Dositheus states. The Eunomians, on the other hand, having counterfeited the mode of the matter of baptism, were wont to be baptized with only one immersion, as is stated in these same words in the canon, which says, For he is speaking of the Eunomians, who were wont to be baptized with only one immersion, etc., just as did the Sibelians the mode of the kind of baptism which is the same as saying that they corrupted the three invocations and taught that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are a single person. But that those heretics whose baptism was recognized by the council were wont to be baptized in the manner of the baptism of the church is borne witness to by Zenorus too, the interpreter of the canons. For in discussing the seventh canon of the second council, he says verbatim, These persons, therefore, are not rebaptized because as respects holy baptism they differ in nothing from us, but are wont to be baptized equally the same as are the Orthodox. But that, on the contrary, those heretics whose baptism was not recognized by the council were not wont to be baptized in the style of the baptism of the church, is borne witness to again by the same Zenoris, who says, As for these, then, and all other heretics, the sacred fathers have decreed that they be baptized. For whether they received holy baptism or not, they have not received it correctly, nor in the form and style prescribed by the Orthodox Church. So because of the fact that those heretics were wont to observe the form of the apostolic baptism, the canons of those two councils accepted them as baptized persons, yet not for this reason alone, but also for the sake of economia, as we have said. For if economia had not been at stake, they certainly would not have flown in the face of the apostolic canons which command the contrary. That is to say, that we must not recognize or accept the baptism of heretics. All this theory which we have been setting forth here is not anything superfluous. On the contrary, it is something which is most needful, both on every occasion in general but especially today on account of the great controversy and the widespread dispute which is going on in regard to the baptism of the Latins, not merely between us and the Latins, but also between us and the Latin-minded, otherwise known as Latinizers. So, following what has been said since the form of the apostolical canon demands it, we declare that the baptism of the Latins is one which falsely is called baptism, and for this reason it is not acceptable or recognizable either on grounds of ecrivia or on grounds of economia. It is not acceptable on grounds of ecrivia, first, because they are heretics. That the Latins are heretics, there is no need of our producing any proof for the present. The very fact that we have entertained so much hatred and aversion against them for so many centuries is a plain proof that we loathe them as heretics in the same way, that is to say, as we do Arians or Sibelians 
or spirit-denying and spirit-defying Macedoniacs. If, however, anyone should like to apprehend their heresies from books, you will find all of them in the books of the Most Holy Patriarch of Jerusalem, Sir Docithius the Papomastix, i.e. Scourge of Popes, together with their most learned refutations. Nevertheless, he can obtain sufficient knowledge even from the booklet of learned miniatos entitled A Rock of Scandal to translate into English the Greek title of it, Petra Scandalu. Enough was said concerning them by St. Mark of Ephesus in Florence at the 25th General Assembly, who spoke frankly as follows. We have split ourselves off from the Latins for no other reason than the fact that they are not only schismatics, but also heretics. Wherefore, we must not even think of uniting with them. Even the great Ecclesiarch Sylvester, section 9, chapter 5, said, The difference of the Latins is a heresy, and our predecessors also held it to be such. So, it being admitted that the Latins are heretics of long standing, it is evident in the very first place that this fact that they are unbaptized, in accordance with the assertions of St. Basil the Great above cited, and of the saints preceding him named Cyprian and Firmilian. Because, having become laymen as a result of their having been cut off from the Orthodox Church, they no longer have with them the grace of the Holy Spirit, with which Orthodox priests perform the mysteries. This is one argument which is as strong and indisputable as the canons of St. Basil the Great are strong and indisputable. And the words of St. Cyprian the Ecclesiastic Martyr, seeing that they have received and retained the sanctions of the Holy Sixth Ecumenical Council. The Latins are unbaptized because they do not observe the three immersions which have to be administered to the one being baptized, as the Orthodox Church has received instructions from the Holy Apostles from the beginning. The earlier Latins, being the first to innovate with regard to the apostolical baptism, began using effusion, which means the process of pouring a little water on the head of the child, a practice which is still in vogue in some regions. But the most of them take a bundle of hog hairs and sprinkle a few drops of water three times on the infant's forehead. In other parts of the earth, however, as we have been informed by one who has returned thence, they merely take a little cotton, everyone knows how much water cotton absorbs, and dipping it into water, they wipe the child with it and call it baptized. So the Latins are unbaptized because they do not perform the three immersions and immersions in accordance with the apostolic tradition. As touching these three immersions, we do not say how necessary and indispensable they are to the celebration of baptism. Whoever wishes may read about it, but as for any need there may be, let him read the manual of the highly educated and most learned Estratius of Argent. But we too shall say in connection with Apostolical Canon 50, whatever is now needed on this head. If, however, anyone among the Latins or the Latin-minded should put forth a claim to the three invocations of the Holy Trinity, he must not pretend to have forgotten those things, which he was told further above by sacred Firmilian and by Athanasius the Great, to wit, that those super-godly names are idle and ineffective when pronounced by the mouths of heretics. For unless this be the case, we must most certainly believe that those wicked old women actually do miracles by simply repeating the divine names in incantations. So the Latins cannot even perform a baptism because they are heretics, and have lost the grace required to celebrate Christmas rites. And they have added to their iniquities that of overthrowing the apostolical baptism of three immersions. So I say, let those who accept the Latin sprinkling, often dignified by the name aspersion, reflect what they can say by way of reply to the authority of the present apostolical canon, and further in reply to the following one, number 47. I know what the immediate defensors of the Latin pseudo-baptism argue. They argue that our church became accustomed to accepting converts from the Latins with chrism alone, and there is, in fact, 
some formulation to be found in which the terms are specified under which we will take them in. With regard to all this, we reply in simple and just words, that it is enough that you admit that she used to receive them in chrism alone. So they are heretics. For why the chrism if they are not heretics? So, they being admittedly heretics, it is not probable that the Orthodox and Apostolic Church would deliberately disregard these apostolical canons and the synodical canons which we have noted in the preceding pages. But, as it seems, and as it is proper for us to believe, the Church wished to employ some great economia with respect to the Latins, having as an example conducive to her purpose that great and holy second ecumenical council. For the fact is that the second council, as we have said, employed economia and accepted the baptism of Arians and of Macedoniacs, with the aim and hope of their returning to the faith and receiving full understanding of it, and in order to prevent their becoming yet more savage wild beasts against the church. Since they were also over many in multitude, and strong in respect of outward things. And, as a matter of fact, they accomplished this purpose and realized this hope. For thanks to this economia, those men became more gentle toward the Orthodox Christians and returned so far to piety that within the space of a few years they either disappeared completely or very few of them remained. So those preceding us also employed economia and accepted the baptism of the Latins, especially when performed in the second manner, because papism, or popery, was then in its prime and had all the forces and powers of the kings of Europe in its hands, while, on the other hand, our own kingdom was breathing its last gaps. Hence, it would have become necessary if that economia had not been employed for the Pope to rouse the Latin races against the Eastern, take them prisoners, kill them, and inflict countless other barbarities upon them. But now that they are no longer able to inflict such woes upon us, as a result of the fact that Divine Providence has lent us such a guardian, that he has at least beaten down the brow of those arrogant and haughty monsters, now I say that the fury of papism otherwise known as Roman Catholicism or Popery, is of no avail against us. What need is there any longer of economia? For there is a limit to economia, and it is not perpetual and indefinite. That is why Theophylactus of Bulgaria says, He who does anything as a matter of economia does it, not as simply something good, but as something needed for the time being. Commentary on Galatians 5.11 We have employed economia enough, says St. Gregory the Theologian in his eulogy of Athanasius, without either adopting what is alien or corrupting what is our own, to do which would make us really bad economists or poor managers of economia. That is what I say too. It is certainly poor economia when it does not serve to convert the Latins and forces us to transgress the acrivia of the sacred canons and to accept the pseudo-baptism of heretics. For economia is to be employed where there is no necessity of transgressing the laws, says divine Chrysostom. The fact that that formulation was made economically is plainly evident from this that until then the Easterners had been baptizing the returning Westerners, as is attested by the local synod in the Lateran of Rome, held in the year 1211 after Christ. For it says in its fourth canon that the Easterners would not hold services wherever Westerners had been holding services unless they first purified the place by the ceremony of sanctification. And afterwards it says that the Easterners themselves rebaptized those joining the Eastern Church on the ground that they had not had a holy apostolical baptism. See Docythius, page 8 to 24 of the Dodeca Biblis. So when it is taken into account that up to that time, according to the testimonies of the same enemies, 
the Easterners had been baptizing them, it is plain that it was for the sake of a great economia that they later employed the expedient of chrism simply because our race could not afford, in the plight in which it then was in, to excite any further the mania of popery. And in addition, there is such evidence in the fact that they then abrogated and invalidated all that had been wrongly done in Florence. And there was great excitement among the Latins on this account. So, the need of economia having passed away, Acrivia and the apostolical canons must have their place. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, of St. Nicodemus of the Holy Mountain, O Lord Jesus Christ our God, have mercy on us. Amen.